Um, so I'm really excited to be on here, even though I can't see you all today. It's nice to be talking to and interacting with other people. This is the first time I put on my uniform in a month and my pants still fit. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but it, I've been missing all the visitors for the past month. I've been working from home. So really excited to shor share more about Voyagers National Park with you today. But before I get started on that, I just wanted to go over some of the modifications to operations the park has made to implement the latest guidelines from the White House, CDC, and local and state authorities to promote social distancing. So as of April 10th through May 4th, reservations for camping at Voyagers National Park through recreation.gov will be suspended. So this is in accordance with the state of Minnesota governor's state home guidance. The Rainy Lake Visitor Center and park headquarters continue to remain closed through May 4th. Future camping reservations and other modifications will be assessed in conjunction with any additional safety guidelines that may be implemented. So in addition to those temporary closures and to stay in accordance with proper social distancing um, for the safety of visitors, park partners and staff, the park has modified the following operations through the 2020 season. So for the Rainy Lake and Cabotogama Lake Group campsite reservations, those reservations already made will be honored. Through the remainder of the summer operational period, these sites will be managed as large individual campsites. For the King Williams Narrows and Makuta campgrounds, those reservations already made will be honored. Through the remainder of the summer operational period, site A in each campground will remain open for reservations, but sites B through E will be closed. Through the end of May, concession operations at the Kettle Falls Hotel will be limited to the sale of marina gas and ported services only. Beyond May, services are likely to be limited. So check out kettlefallshotel.com for updates there. And park boat tours have been suspended through the operational season. As additional operational changes are defined and implemented, future press releases will be distributed. The park is still working really hard to figure things out. So if any of you have any questions about what's happening beyond May 4th, um, you're just going to have to stay tuned. We'll pay, post updates on our Facebook page as well as our website as well. And BNPA will share those as well. So we'll keep you updated as we know more. So with all that said, it can seem like a really strange time to be doing a presentation on how to enjoy the park when many of us are staying um, put in our homes and have no real sense of when it will feel normal and safe to be traveling again. However, with more time at home, we have more time to plan trips and having something to plan and look forward to can help during these uncertain times. Also, some parks do take a little bit more logistical planning to see um, and do everything you'd want to do, and Voyagers is one of those places. Since we are a water-based park with only a few roads, there's some more planning that has to be done to get to some of our campsites and do and hike some of our trails and to find the best way for you to get out on the water in the park, whether that be through a boat tour or canoe or kayak rentals. Um, so today I'll be talking a little bit about the ways that people enjoy Voyagers National Park. So for most of today, um, you won't be looking at my face, you'll be looking at a presentation so you can see some of um, the things that you can do within Voyagers National Park. So I'll begin sharing my screen here. All right. All right. So here we go. A little bit about Voyagers National Park. So we were authorized in 1971 and established in 1975 to preserve for the inspiration and enjoyment of present and future generations for three reasons. One, for our outstanding scenery. So the park is on a transition zone between a deciduous forest and boreal forest. For our geological conditions. So Voyagers is one of the few places that you can see and touch rocks half the age of the earth. And Three, the waterway system, which constituted a part of the historic route of the Voyagers. So we protect the historic water route paddled by the Voyagers during the fur trade period over 200 years ago. This was part of their 3000 mile route that helped shape the US and Canadian border. So Voyagers National Park by the number. So we're a little over 218,000 acres. We have 344 square miles with 655 miles of undeveloped shoreline we're 40% water and 1,000 islands. So well, all that to say is we're big enough for everyone, whether you're an angler, kayaker, sightseer, houseboater, hiker, historian, or birders, there's um, space and a place for you to enjoy Voyagers National Park. 
So some getting around in logistics is a, what a lot of people have questions about when they're learning how to visit Voyagers National Park. So since we are 40% water, um, we do have to get way into the park through Gateway Community. So they provide entry points into the park and also provide lodging for people to stay in the area. So our campsites are only accessible by water and I'll go into camping a little bit more later on in this presentation. And then there's boat rentals in the area, whether that be through local services. And um, this year, unfortunately, we don't have National Park Service tour boats, but if you're planning for 2021 or beyond, um, do look into National Park Service tour boats. And then if you're looking for campgrounds in the area that you um, don't have to go by boat to, there are some DNR campgrounds that I'll point out. So here is a map of Voyagers National Park. So we are five hours north from the Twin Cities. And then when I was talking about the entry points to get into the park, um, here's what those look like. There's one down here in Crane Lake. Then there's one here by the Ash River Visitor Center, Cabotogamo Lake Visitor Center, and the Rainy Lake Visitor Center. So each of those are pretty spaced out. So for example, from the Ash River Visitor Center to the Cabotogamo Visitor Center, that drives about 25 minutes from parking lot to parking lot, and then maybe another 40, 45. So from Cabotogam up to the Rainy Lake Visitor Center. And those provide entry points into the park. And each of those areas have gateway communities and places for you to stay at a lodge or hotel or the campgrounds I was talking about is there's the Wooden Frog State Forest Campground that I'm circling around here with the laser pointer um, near the Cabotogam Visitor Center. So that has about 60 sites, first come, first serve. And then there's another one near the Ash River Visitor Center area. Um, that's the Ash River State Forest Campground. And then here's some pictures of common ways that people enjoy the park. So one of my personal favorite ways is getting out and kayaking. Um, I love to be on the water and paddling around. So I'll show you some sites to go around there and paddle. A lot of people come here to fish and enjoy boating on the lakes here, or they enjoy hiking here. Or like I was saying, not this year, but in future years, we do have tour boat services through the park. Um, so you can get on a tour boat through and have a guided tour through the National Park Service. And then people also really enjoy the park by houseboating. It can be a great way to have somewhere to stay and boat around the water and see a lot of different parts of the park. So within the park, we do have 50 miles of hiking trails. And then we have 13 official visitor destinations. So these are places you can boat to and stop that have interpretive signage so you can learn a little bit more about the history of the park. And I'll talk about a couple of those today. And then we have 26 day use sites. So if you're out boating, you can stop on these, stretch your legs a little bit, um, use a picnic table or such. So here is another map of the park to go to those hiking trails that I was talking about, the 50 miles. So if you wanna drive to some of our hiking trails, there's the most near the Ash River Visitor Center area, right around here. There's some hiking trails there. There's one near the Cabotogama Visitor Center. And then there's some trails near the Rainy Lake Visitor Center. And we also have some that you have to boat to. So this nice long cruiser lake trail system here, then also one to the locator lake trail there. I'll talk about a little bit more later. And then if you're looking at a map here, anything in bold that's kind of out on the islands, those would be our visitor destinations. So I'm searching Ellsworth Rock Gardens here, Kettle Falls, there's some down in Hoist Bay. Um, and if you go on to the Voyagers National Park website, you can learn a little bit more about each of those visitor destinations that you can stop at at the park. So a lot of people like to know about the wildlife that they can see when they visit Voyagers National Park. So within the park, we do have black bears, wolves, and moose that you can see. We do have a lot of beavers. We have over 3,000 beavers in the park. So it's fun to see those guys swimming around and um, see that the different um, lodges and dams that they construct is very prevalent within the park. Then we have otters and over 240 species of birds. So there's lots of chances for wildlife spottings within the park. And then People often wonder about the northern lights within the park. So the distance from city lights and northern lat latitude of the park makes for wonderful nighttime shows here. And you do have the opportunity to see um, the northern lights when you're in Voyagers National Park. So today I just wanna go over 10 ways to find your park. There's more than 10 ways to enjoy this park. So if you visited before um, and you have some suggestions, feel free to leave those in the comments, whether that be in 
um, Zoom or on our Facebook page to help other people plan. But if you haven't been here before, kind of narrowing down to 10 ways that you can see and enjoy a lot of voyagers um, can be really, really helpful. So I'll go over kind of 10 ways and different areas of the park and things that there are to enjoy. So number 10 would be paddling around the Ash River Visitor Center area. So it's one of my favorite areas to paddle around. I'm a little bit biased because this was the area where I lived last summer, but I find it really nice because if you look on the map here, um, where you would launch from for it to paddle, if you go to the left, you can paddle into Blind, Bash, Blind Ash Bay. And if you go to the right, you can go down into Sullivan Bay. So it's nice if it's a little bit windier of a day, it can be a little bit more protected for you here. And then also a thing I like to do is if you paddle into Blind Ash Bay, it's kind of nice to get the perspective um, of what that area looks like from the water. And then also you can do that hiking trail to get the perspective from that. There's also a campsite that goes straight across from the visitor center. Um, but I just like this area because it's a little bit more protected and where if you haven't, um, don't have a lot of canoe or kayak experience, this might be kind of the best area so you can kind of stay in a protected area along the shorelines. But whether you're paddling around Ash River or Cabotogma or Rainy, there's a lot of great options to, to see the park. All right, and then we have exploring Makuta and Grassy Bay Cliffs. So this area is about 10 and a half miles from Crane Lake, and it has the unique geology and granite cliffs. Um, so these granite cliffs here um, at the Grassy Bay Cliffs raise 125 feet above the surface of Sandpoint Lake. So Voyagers is situated on the southern tip of the Canadian Shield, which is a gigantic dome of volcanic bedrock that forms the heart of the North American continent. So this bedrock dates back more, um, 200, 2.8 billion years, 2.8 billion years, um, which is pretty cool to get to see this nice granite cliff up close. It's one of the most photographed parts in the park and it's really gorgeous. Um, it's also an area you can snowmobile to in the winter um, and it offers spectacular views any time of the year. And number eight, camping. So um, this would be no, front country camping within the park. Um, so front country camping is campsites that are directly accessible by boat. So if you look here, um, I have a view of some of the campsites here at Voyagers National Park. So any of these along the edge here of the Cabotogama Peninsula or out on an island, those are front country campsites. So you still need a boat to get there, but there's just one um, or there's just one step to get there. So getting there by boat. So you can be along the edge of the Cabotogama Peninsula or you can have an island um, to yourself that you're camping on. And it provides um, nice solitude and great opportunities to stargaze within Voyagers National Park. So Voyagers has been working on getting its dark sky certifications. Um, we've been working really hard to show our commitment to preserving the dark skies here. So if you're out here um, camping and in the wilderness and away from those city lights, you can sit outside your tent and have really phenomenal stargazing. You can see here in this video or to this photo um, that you can see the Milky Way here. Um, so sitting out underneath the stars camping within Voyagers is one of my favorite things to do. And then again, we are talking about seeing the Northern Lights. So you have the opportunity there when you're out in the islands. Now, if you're coming and wondering about your chances of seeing the Northern Lights, what the park checks, um, or what I would check to tell visitors every day, is looking at the forecast from the University of Alaska Fairbanks that can show you um, the level of activity from the aurora for that night. Um, and then you can check that and see your opportunities, but it's really great nighttime viewing here within the park. So if you go out late at night, give your eyes maybe a half an hour to adjust or so, um, you can get some really, really great views of the night sky and one of my favorite ways to enjoy the park for sure. So that was a front country site. So this, finding your way to the interior chain of lakes, this would be a back country site. So a back country site to campsite here is there's a, a more additional steps to get there. So you have to travel on boats on the large lakes to get to a trailhead and then hike a trail into the back country. Um, and then for the chain of lakes here, there's one additional step beyond that. You have to um, take a canoe to finally reach your campsite. 
So these campsites are really great. It's a nice wilderness experience. They're secluded. So these backcountry sites on our, are, are on our interior lakes. So they're very secluded. And when you're camping on that lake, there's only one campsite per lake. So it seems like it's your lake for the night, which is um, a really cool experience. So it's very secluded. Um, they offer great fishing opportunities and really wonderful opportunities to see wildlife spottings. Um, and then it's paddle only. And then on the chain of lakes here, there's also a bonus that it's a snowmobile trail in the winter. So this chain of lakes that I'm talking about is circled here. So again, the backcountry sites, you'd have to take a boat here to that trailhead, hike in, and then another additional step to get to these locator ones on the locator lake trail. Um, you have to take a canoe to get out to these sites here too. And if you're at these back two sites, then you have to take a little portage to get at them too. So you're really secluded um, in the back part of the park and it's really cool. So here are some views from the Locator Lake Trail. It's about a two mile hike to get into there. And then this is what the view would like, look like from Quill Lake. So it's really um, a really gorgeous part of the park. And if you're able to, um, I definitely recommend getting out and doing some backcountry camping. Number six, I would say, is plan a visit for the winter here. Um, so this past winter, I was able to spend my first winter here within the park. Um, and it can sound a little intimidating when we think of planning a vacation. We want to go somewhere warm and not go to somewhere that's nicknamed the icebox of the nation. But winters within Voyagers are truly phenomenal. Um, here in this picture, you can see an ice road. This past winter, we were only open, able to open up a short portion of our ice road near um, the Cabotogama Lake Visitor Center, but on other years we have many, many miles of roads going out of both Cabotogama and the Rainy Lake Visitor Center. So that gives you a nice opportunity to drive in places that you would have normally needed a boat to travel around. And then we also um, have some nice viewing. You have opportunities to see some nice birds here that are just here during the winter. Um, and then we do have a sledding hill that's near the Cabotoma Lake Visitor Center out on an island. Um, people might camp there in the summer at Spung Island. And then the park also maintains ski trails. Um, we have some near the Rainy Lake Visitor Center, some across the lake, and then some um, down in the Cabotoma area. Then the park loans out skis and snowshoes from the Rainy Lake Visitor Center. So if you're coming from an area and you've never tried them before or don't have your own, you can stop by the Visitor Center um, get to experience winter here. One of my favorite things about winter is I really like to go out and see the tracks from the different animals. I feel a little bit more connected to the wildlife that we have. I can see who's been around even if I'm not seeing them in person. I can at least see the signs that they're around. So I really enjoy winter. Um, you can enjoy it here in the park whether that be by a snowshoe, ski, or snowmobile, but it can be a really great way to see the park. So I'd encourage you to plan a winter visit here. Number five, we have, back, going back to summer, we have having lunch at the Ellsworth Rock Garden. So earlier I was talking about the visitor destinations of the park. So Ellsworth Rock Gardens is a really popular one um, within the park. It's been called the showplace of Cabotogma since the 1940s. So it's a garden here and it's called Ellsworth Rock Gardens named after Jack Ellsworth, who spent over 20 years constructing this garden. It has 62 flower beds and over 200 rock sculptures within the park. If you come out here, it's only accessible by water. So if you boat out here, there's a nice brochure that can take you through the gardens and see what you see or see the different rock sculptures throughout this rock garden. And there's a nice little gazebo you can stop um, and have lunch at. And there's a comfort station there as well. It's a really cool place. It's a great place to stop for lunch. My favorite time of day is around sunset. It's really gorgeous in this garden and it's really cool to see um, what somebody did for 20 years of their life kind of um, building this gorgeous, gorgeous rock garden and the park does a really wonderful job of maintaining that. And number four, we have another visitor destination. So this is Kettle Falls. Um, so this is a hotel within the park it's about 13 miles from the Ash River Visitor Center. It was built in 1913 
Um, and it has hotels, villas, a restaurant, and a saloon within the park. So if you want to, um, it's a place you can stay within the park. Like I was saying before we started, um, operations are going to be modified for Kettle Falls for this summer. So it's best to go to their website, kettlefallshotel.com, to stay up to date on what operations are going to look like for this summer. Um, but if you're planning for 2021 or beyond, um, we often have park boat tours that go out here. Um, some people who go out with fishing charters or private boat tours will often stop here for lunch. Um, and it can be a really cool place to stop and get into the park. And it can be a great place to stay um, within the park and get that wilderness experience, but still be able to stay in a hotel if that's something that's more comfortable for you. Number three, we have viewing Rainy Lake from Anderson Bay. So this is 23 miles from the Rainy Lake Visitor Center. If you come out here, there's a two mile loop hike that you can do to see some great views from the bay. Um, it's also the northern trailhead for the Cruiser Lake Trail, which I'll be talking about in a minute. And then these white granite cliffs rise 80 feet from the water here in Rainy Lake. So it's a really um, wonderful place to stop and get a great view of Rainy Lake. And while we're talking about Rainy Lake, it's also a great place to go fishing. So within the park, we have over 50 species of fish, including lake sturgeon, walleye, northern pike, black crappie, and smallmouth bass. And some may say we have the best walleye fishing in the country, um, but there's sure, certainly great fishing here within the park. Um, it's a really popular activity, especially on Rainy. If you do come here to go fishing, you'll need a Minnesota fishing license. Um, so you can get those through the DNR in the state. But it's a really great way to get out here and enjoy the park and get some nice walleye. Number two is birding. So it's something that I've recently been getting really into within the park. We have over 240 species of birds. So it's a great place to have an opportunity to see a wide array of birds within the park. A really popular one that people love to view when they're here is our eagles. So we have 40 breeding pairs here within the park, so they're pretty common and pretty popular to see. You can often see their nests along the water. They'll nest in some tall white pines. Um, they typically, when we do boat tours, they steal the show. Um, they're really gorgeous to see. Loons are also common within the park. Our Minnesota state bird is the loon, so it's great to see them. And you'll also hear the loon's beautiful call over the water in the evening. <clears throat> and then also my personal favorite birds to go look for in the park is warblers. So Minnesota does have the highest breeding, population of breeding warblers. And we're a hotspot over, over 24 species of warblers called the park home. So they're a great way to fun way to go out and get on the trails and start spotting warblers in the trees. You will either see them in the treetops or going along the ground, um, but it can be a great place to kind of look and get into birding. Then number one, um, my personal favorite way to enjoy the park is hiking on the Cruiser Lake Trail. So it's a nine and a half mile trail. Um, it's six miles from the Ash River Visitor Center, so it's only accessible by water. Um, they, it's a trail that gets you to a lot of our backcountry campsites. And on those campsites, um, a lot of them, you have the option to rent a canoe. So those backcountry campsites, you don't have to take the canoe on a lot of these to get out to your spot, but we have canoes there for you um, if you want to rent those while you're staying out there. Um, you get to hike through a diverse array of habitats here within the park. Um, there's some really stunning beaver ponds along the Cruiser Lake Trail. Um, it's just nice to kind of sit in awe of what the beavers are capable of making. And this is your best opportunity to see the large mammals if you're hoping to maybe get to see a wolf or a moose. Um, and then, like I said, beavers are around here too. This is probably your best bet. And even if you don't see them on the trail, being out here in secluded, you might see signs of them, whether that be scat or track, or you might be able to hear them during the evening. Um, but it's nice to kind of feel secluded and out into the wilderness of voyagers. Um, so here on the map shows you where the Cruiser Lake Trail is. So it's here you can leave from like the Ash River Visitor Center area um, to get over to the Cruiser Lake Trail. 
So now that we've talked about some of the 10 ways to enjoy the park, um, a lot of what I've talked about takes a little bit more logistics to get out there, um, especially for camping. So if you're wanting to camp, we do have over 200 campsites, houseboat sites and day use sites that are accessible by water only. Um, so I talked a little bit about our front country and back country sites. So those front country sites only take one step to get out there. So they're accessible, um, directly accessible by boat versus the back country that takes one to do two additional steps, whether that's you take a boat to the trailhead and hike into your campsite, or you take a boat to your trailhead, hike in to your canoe, and then canoe finally to your campsite there. And then you need to make your reservation on recreation.gov and then use a National Geographic or campsite reservation guide are your tools to do that. Um, and then you need to make that reservation at least one day in advance and make sure you print your permit before you get to the park because um, you won't be able to do that once you get here and you'll need to hang that permit at your campsite. Um, and then a lot of these campsites, they'll tell you on recreation.gov either if they have a dock, sand, or soft rock access. And then they're about $16 to $28 a night with a $10 reservation fee. And then to get out here, this is the important part that a lot of people have questions about. So if you go to our website at nps.gov slash VOYA, or even if you just Google Voyagers National Park, our page will pop up. And then under this plan your visit tab is really helpful. So you'll click on that. And then underneath there, there's one that says find local guides, rental craft, water taxis, and more. And you'll click on that and a page like this will pop up. So under that page, it'll tell you the business name, how to contact them. And then it also tells you what services they offer. So if you were interested in the fishing I talked about, you can see who's offering a fishing guide or whether that be winter, you want somebody to show you around on a canoe or kayak, or if you just want to rent it, um, it shows you different right away. So for some people coming from the area who don't have boats and want to camp within the park, you often want to contact a water taxi or shuttle that can take you out and drop you off in your campsite and then pick you up later. So this is a great tool. It has, it's separated by lakes. So whether you wanna be up here and staying around Rainy Lake or Cabotogama Ash River area or down in Crane Lake, it gives you the options of the services there for who is authorized to provide services within Voyagers National Park. So this is a great resource because it can feel a little bit intimidating on how to reach out and find these services to get you to your campsite or to find a rental for a canoe or kayak. Um, so this is a great place to start looking. So in general, what are you waiting for? Voyagers National Park um, has something for everyone, whether you want to just go out birding or if you want to fish or you really like canoeing, kayaking, or you want a different um, camping experience by staying on a camp spot that you can only get to by water. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to enjoy Voyagers National Park. Um, and it just takes maybe a little bit more planning to see what looks right for you. We are such a large park. Um, I would Oh. Somebody might need to mute their mic there. I would recommend if you're planning a trip to the park and you've never been here before, maybe just pick one area that you want to explore a little bit more. Um, we are large, so it can be very hard to try and see everything that the park has to offer. I still haven't seen everything that the park has to offer and I've been here for a full year. Um, so maybe just pick one of those gateway communities and um, take some time and get to know that area and paddle around it and then plan another trip for the future. Um, that can make it seem a little bit less um, daunting of a task to, to try and plan rather than to try and see all of the park at once would be my advice. But if you want to try and see it all, then, then more power to you. So if you have any questions, I'll try and get the, we'll stop sharing here and get the chat up. Here. So if you have any questions, feel free to type it in or um, talk to any of the hosts and we'll relay it. And then from Brian said, winter, we hiked out to Little American Island over the ice. Good way to see the islands if you don't have a boat. Yep, I agree with that too. It's really, um, you can ski across the lake, you can snowshoe on it. So it's a really great way to get out to the islands and see the park if you haven't been on the ice yet. Um, so I think it's just a really nice way to be able to see more of the park um, without having to have a boat so you can get out there and get onto the water by foot. And it did take me a little bit on the ice road to get the confidence to drive up with my car, but the 
the park does a really great job of testing the safety of that. So driving on the ice road for the first time was a really, really cool experience for me. So somebody said, will your talk be archived, please? Um, yes, I believe Voyagers National Park Association is recording this, so they'll have it saved. Can you repeat again about reservations as developing cur currently with COVID restrictions? Um, so in the beginning, I talked a little bit about our modifications to the park and what has changed. Um, so we're making uh, till May 4th camping is suspended with the park. I wish I could give you more information of what it's going to look like for sure after May 4th, but the park is working hard to figure out that situation since it's constantly developing. A good way to stay up to date with that is by following Voyagers National Park on Facebook and also Voyagers National Park Association does a really great job of relaying that information too. And then we also put out press releases as any more information um, becomes available to us. So we miss you. I miss you. I'm, my job is normally interacting with visitors and um, I haven't seen anybody since the people I live with in a month. So I'm really missing visitors and want you to get out here, but um, you'll just have to stay up to date as more developments come, come along. Okay, another question is, are the ranger stations open or what can we visit with current COVID re restrictions? I'd love to visit soon. So in, um, as of now, the headquarters and Rainy Lake Visitor Center are currently closed. Um, beyond that, it'll kind of, uh, we'll have to see how things develop and any guidance that comes down from the governors. Our trails are still open. If you do choose to go out and recreation or recreate um, outside during this time, I ask that you follow um, the uh, guidelines that the Minnesota DNR has put out. So um, we'll try and get that in the comments here and post it on Facebook too. So staying six feet apart away from each other, trying to stay in your local community commuting area and only being with those who live with you in your household. Um, so right now our headquarters and our visitor centers are currently closed and the trails are open, um, but please be, uh, be safe and do all that you can to take care of yourself and your family during this time. All right. And it looks like um, they just posted the link to the outdoor recreation guidelines. So please take a look at those, read those over and follow those um, so you can recreate outside safely. Yesterday it hit 60 for the first time and it felt so good to be outside. Um, and then if you are in the area um, and if you're going outside, a great way to help people connect with Voyagers National Park is take pictures and share them with the park. Um, people who can't be in the area, it's really nice to see pictures and, and to stay connected to a place that they can't currently get to. All right, any last minute questions? We'll wait and see here. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask here in the Zoom chat or whenever we post this talk on Facebook, um, you can ask your comments there and Voyagers National Park Association um, or me on Voyagers National Park Facebook page will try and get back to your questions as soon as possible um, that we can to help you plan your trip. Um, if you are planning a trip for the future, a great resource is, is both the Voyagers National Park Association website and um, the National Park uh, Service website for Voyagers is a really great resource to help you plan your visit, give you some nice information there, or you can always call um, our hotline at the park and we'll get back to you as soon as we can to help you plan your trip especially in a park here that takes a little bit more logistical planning. Sometimes it's nice to talk to a ranger and get some advice. So we're always happy to help you there. But there aren't any more questions. I'm really excited that I got to talk to you all today and tell you about the park that I love. Again, we're so excited, or I'm so excited that I was able to share this with you today um, and then hope this helps you plan your trip for the future. Um, again, I miss you all. I miss visitors. So it's nice to be able to talk to other people. So thanks for all um, for tuning in today and hope to see you in the future.